Hello and welcome to module 3 of the paper International Criminal Justice. In this module, we will study jurisdiction, arriving at an international consensus against impunity. My name is Professor Rashmi Raman. The learning outcomes in this module. You will be acquainted with the concepts of impunity, international jurisdiction and universal jurisdiction. You will learn about the nexus between international criminal law and human rights law. You will learn about how specific cases have shaped the evolution of international criminal law and the allied legal concepts, South America and Africa. The genesis of international criminal law, how to hold an individual accountable, what is the duty of the state, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and Impunity, the case of Augusto Pinochet and Impunity, the African Union and the International Criminal Court, Universal Jurisdiction and the Likely End of Impunity. These are the components of this module. Let us begin with the genesis of international criminal law. Originally, international criminal law, stricto sensu, concerned itself only with peace and security of the international community. However, in recent times, it has diversified into the realm of globally recognized human rights. The short period of a little over 100 years has unearthed confusions between international criminal law stricto sensu and international conventional law. The current system of international criminal law comprises genocide, war crime, crimes against humanity, committed in domestic and international armed conflicts, aggression and terrorism. The criminal liability envisaged under international criminal law is qua human beings or individuals that is, criminal responsibility not borne by legal persons, particularly states, holding individuals accountable. The notion of having an individual person as the object of international criminal law is a new focus. One has to choose between the sanction of one superior who order one to execute a violation of human rights and the sanction that awaits in the hands of international criminal law. Impunity no more protects individuals against state-driven actions of violations. Article 7 of the ICC statute holds that individual perpetrators of a widespread or systematic attack of any civilian population with prior knowledge of attack liable for his actions. Part 3 of the ICC statute says crimes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract entities and only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced. Human rights and criminal law are two separate concepts with separate histories. Human rights are values which every state is obliged to adhere to in its relationship with the individuals under its jurisdiction. Criminal law is primarily a code of conduct that the state issues to prohibit individuals from acting or sometimes abstaining from acting in a prescribed manner. There is a common element to both, the preservation of human dignity. Acts including genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, torture and enforced disappearances, if perpetrated by an individual, constitute a crime. It is also precisely these that make the subject matter of international criminal law, wherein the state is held liable to bring justice to the victims. The duty of the state. International human rights has taken into account the human rights infringement by having held individual perpetrators accountable before appropriate courts in the respective states that have jurisdiction. States are mandated to lead a thorough, impartial and prompt investigation culminating in the indictment and punishment of individuals. States which err on this duty have not made good on their promise of a dignified life and in extension their promise of human rights. The control procedures under human rights law do not directly concern individuals guilty of international crimes but rather are aimed at states. 
says the statute. Therefore, whenever a criminal conduct infringes a human right, the international human rights should compel states to punish those responsible for their transgression in order to the conform to the duties that they have towards their civilians. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or the ICCPR, came about to impose a duty to prosecute general human rights violations apart from those covered in specific conventions such as the Torture Convention, the Apartheid Convention and the Slavery Convention. There exists no explicit provision under the Covenant to prosecute individual violators of human rights. But the Human Rights Committee or the HRC, a treaty body assigned with the supervision of the state party's compliance, has elaborated the meaning of the Convention. The Committee's work provides an interpretation of the ICCPR, but whether it is binding is debatable. The Human Rights Committee hasn't yet recognized a victim to prosecute a perpetrator under the ICCPR. The Human Rights Committee has been persistent in getting the International Criminal Court to prosecute under Article 2, Para 3 of the ICCPR. The Human Rights Committee has stated, open quote, that the state party is under a duty to prosecute criminally and try and punish those held responsible, end quote. The Human Rights Committee has been very hesitant to fully bestow, by means of interpretation, individuals the right to prosecute anyone under its provision. On the question of impunity, the committee has denounced it as an obstacle to the undertaking to further the respect of human rights. Impunity, the HRC holds, is in violation of covenant rights. In its comments on a matter concerning Burundi, the Human Rights Committee opined that de facto impunity will be an impediment for restoration of lasting peace. Impunity, if recognized, would amount to retroactive ratification of the offences committed. Despite all this, and its holding that impunity would be a violation of the substantive rights accorded by the International Convent Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it sees its denial of individual rights to prosecute as a different paradigm, not in close relation to the impunity that it denounces. The work of this committee is also validating the words of the ICCPR that mandates the state to prosecute without giving any individual right to bring a perpetrator to court. The Human Rights Committee has, through its comments, asked states to treat those who may claim impunity in a manner other than customary sanctions dispensed against them. The Human Rights Committee has foreseen some related duties of the states, and that may be complementary to the state's duty to prosecute. One such duty is the duty to investigate an alleged incident or offence. In its comment on Rodriguez versus Uruguay, the committee stressed that in the absence of investigation, civil remedies like compensation are not possible. This duty is seen as independent of the primary duty and as an aid to combat impu impunity. Along with this, preventive justice seems to be something that the HRC is urging the states to fight for. This is also seen as a fight to end impunity. Only identification and punishment of those responsible would do so, since it would make plain that there was no impunity for such action and to prevent any repetition, close quote, stated the HRC in its third report on Morocco. The HRC has reiterated over time the absence of an individual's right to prosecute under the ICCPR, but is of the view that the deterrent effect of punishing violators is more important and that impunity should not be an impediment for prosecution. The duty to prosecute is present as a direct attack on the defensive cloak of impunity. It stated that if past crimes are not punished, it undermines efforts to establish respect for human rights, contributes to an atmosphere of impunity, and constitutes a very serious impediment to efforts undertaken to consolidate democracy and promote respect for human rights, and is thus in violation of Article 2 of the Covenant. It is also felt that general amnesties should not be given out easily, as it hampers reconciliation, and if given, impunity should be strictly checked. Otherwise, it weakens the human rights, democracy, and the establishment of peace. 
and above all, the rule of law. The criticism against amnesty for violations of human rights is that the HRC opposes the view that amnesty is essential for the re-establishment of peace and harmony and that it is not respectful of human rights. It is based on the right of the victim to effectively remedy as promised under Article 2, Para 3 of the ICCPR and the duty to uphold the rights in the covenant as promised under Article 2, Para 1 of the ICCPR. The stand of the HRC on amnesty and impu impunity is not forever. We hope that this changes. What is impunity? Impunity is the exemption from or protection against penalty or punishment. A famous illustration of this is the case of Augusto Pinochet. Pinochet was the former head of the state of Chile. He was arrested on 16th October 1998 in London by an arrest warrant issued by Spanish authorities. The warrant alleged that the senator's involvement in the murders of Spanish nationals in Chile between September 1993 and December 1993. The Spanish authorities wished to extradite him. In its judgment, dated November 1998, the House of Lords held by a three to two majority that Pinochet did not have immunity. As a former head of state, he would continue to enjoy immunity with respect to acts performed in the exercise of the functions of a head of state. Torture, and taking of hostages cannot be regarded as part of those functions. The acts to which immunity is attached were those recognized by international law as the functions of a head of state. Therefore, Augusto Pinochet, for acts committed outside of this umbrella of legitimacy, did not get immunity. When the possibility of a bias appeared in its ruling, the House of Lords set the judgment aside. An appeal from the High Court was to be reheard. The judges acknowledged that the use of torture as a state policy is a crime against humanity. It was held as a violation of a use Kogan's norm. This, they said, justified them in taking universal jurisdiction over torture. A quick explanation of what use Kogan's rules are. Use Kogan's are certain peremptory norms of international criminal law from which no derogation is permissible. What does this mean? Use Kogans is the name given to a certain group of rules that have evolved through customary practice to be recognized by all states as so heinous that they destroy the basic fabric of the collective consciousness of mankind. Crimes under this include genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The creation of this illusory idea of use Kogans has been extraordinarily helpful in the development of international criminal law. Essentially what this does is that it changes the argument of jurisdiction on its head. Normally, there are certain grounds for jurisdiction. Under municipal law, these could be a temporal ground, which means that there is a time limit given and actions which take place within this time limit are allowed to be tried by one court. Or it could be subject matter jurisdiction, which means that there is a list of subject matters and only those subject matters can be heard by a given court. Further, there are also, there's also monetary jurisdiction, there is pecuniary jurisdiction, etc. What is important to all of these is that there has to be a direct link between the action which is sought to be prosecuted and the place or the actor that commit the action. However, the creation of use Kogan's norm has allowed international law to turn the regular arguments for jurisdiction on its head. A new realm of jurisdiction has been created. This is known as universal jurisdiction. This is extraordinarily important in the development and creation of modern international criminal law as we know it. What is universal jurisdiction? Universal jurisdiction is a philosophy. It means that irrespective of where a crime was committed, who committed it, against whom it was committed, if the action itself, that is, if the kind of crime that is committed falls under the category 
of a use Kogan's violation, which could mean that it falls under a genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, torture, aggression, or terrorism. If it falls under these categories, it is possible for any state in the world to bring an action against that crime. And in that case, the actor, the territory, the nexus, none of that matters. Universal jurisdiction changes all of that because now it doesn't matter who committed the crime, where it was committed, or against whom it was committed. What is important is the kind of crime that was committed. If a state is able to prove that the very fabric of the collective consciousness of mankind that we have created through 70 years of relative peace, brokered since the end of the Second World War, has somehow been violated, then that is a tenable argument to sustain a prosecution against an individual in any court, in any member state of the United Nations. Despite this judicial opinion, they sought, sought statutory authority to allow British courts extraterritorial jurisdiction. The extradition laws only allowed extradition for crimes which were properly crimes under law when they were committed. Such acts had to be crimes in both the UK and in the state requesting extradition. This was a legal hurdle that could not be overcome easily. While acknowledging that provisions of the convention were inconsistent with the notion of continuing immunity, it had to reduce the number of charges against Pinochet from 30 to 3 to continue with extradition proceedings. Ultimately, owing to some health issues, Pinochet was sent back to Chile. This final outcome was short of poetic justice, but international jurisprudence on impunity had been altered forever in this case. This case started a trend allowing states to uphold international criminal law and human rights in the sovereign territory of another state, including against heads of state. This case shakes the ground on which the two pillars of classical international law are pinned, state sovereignty and the principle of non-intervention. Human rights was elevated to a place higher than sovereignty and was made the fundamental concern of the international community. Non-intervention was reduced to a privilege that would henceforth be extended to states that delivered the promise of human rights. This also confirmed the principle of complementarity, which is the founding principle of the ICC, which places the primary responsibility of prosecuting individuals on the state itself for the violation of human rights. While the Pinochet case is a ray of hope that emerged to break free from the fetters of impunity, only when all states universally acknowledge their right to prosecute human rights violators will impunity be done away with for good. The African Union and the ICC. A decade after the Rome Statute was established in the ICC, in 2010, a conference was held in Kampala. This was the first attempt to review the international community's fight against impunity and to assess how well the convention had done in the last 10 years of its existence. This exercise had two facilitators for the review, Brazil and Kenya, and had additional country focal points ad addressing complementarity and cooperation, the impact of the Rome Statute system on victims and affected communities, and the outcomes of peace and justice. The Kampala conference signaled a new phase in international law. The role of international ad hoc tribunals was nearing completion, but the fight against impunity was still going strong. Consolidation of the ICC's powers was seen as being essential in an emerging system of international justice. Concurrently, bolstering the justice system within nations was seen as equally important. In the 50th anniversary of the African Union Summit in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in May 2013, the discretionary powers of the prosecutor of the ICJ were discussed. These discretionary powers are hard won. They came to be challenged by some members of the African Union. The response was led by a few primarily North African states who are not parties to the ICC. In response to the issue of an arrest warrant, 
for the president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. These states did not want to hand over the president to the ICC. Following the decision in July 2009, African states, including South Africa, Botswana, and Uganda, publicly denounced the decision and reaffirmed their commitment to the ICC. While support for the ICC was strong from African civil societies before the African Union's decision to protect al-Bashir, in its aftermath, more than 100 civil society groups urged all African states parties to the ICC to reaffirm their commitment. The official U.S. government State Department photo of the President of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. Universal jurisdiction and the likely end of impunity. Impunity in Africa took a huge hit in July 2015. Hisen Habre, the former dictator of Chad, stood trial in the extraordinary African chambers in Senegal. The EAC was inaugurated by the African Union and Senegal to persons most responsible for international crimes committed in Chad between 1982 and 1990, the period when Hissen Habre ruled Chad. This never before seen trial will be the first to have a country prosecute the former head of another country for human rights violations. This is the genesis of universal jurisdiction. Habre was prosecuted for torture, war crimes and crimes against humanity. The reason that the ESE had to be created was to provide for the shortfalls that did not give the ICC jurisdiction to prosecute him. The ICC has jurisdiction over crimes committed only on or after the adoption of the Rome Statute, that is July 1, 2002. Habre's crimes fall between 1982 and 1990. This renders the ICC with no jurisdiction. The ESE is a subsystem within the Senegalese criminal court structure. This means that the Senegalese Code of Conduct criminal procedure drafted along with the inquisitorial civil law model will permit for less strict rules of evidence than in common law systems. The legacy of the Habre case is one of profound impact on impunity. This case signals to the entire world the importance of universal jurisdiction that ensures suspects of atrocities do not enjoy impunity in a third state, while the home of the country of the perpetrator and the international community are unable to prosecute him. Members of the African Union have been encouraged to adopt legislations that would grant national courts universal jurisdiction over genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. However, it's not true that it is only the African states that are pushing this movement. States in other parts of the world are involved as well. Thank you.